such a cramped house will probably be destroyed by these twins soon. Yeah, with such an old apartment, it won't last a day with twins who have developmental issues. My brother John's in-laws, laughing uproariously as they roughly close the door of the apartment room and leave. But I was certain they would regret what they did today. Besides, the three of us will definitely find happiness. I'm Madison. Living for work and I'm currently 30 years old. Just before graduating middle school, my parents died in an accident, and I chose to work instead of continuing my studies. That's because I have a younger brother, John, and I wanted to use all the money our parents left for John's education costs. John is still thankful for that. I don't mind because I'm blessed with good colleagues and enjoy my work life. John was always good at studying, went on to further education, and got a job at a top trading company. He met a wonderful woman there and got married. They were blessed with twin girls and lived happily. Though within the country, since they live a plane right away, we can't meet often. But, John and his wife, Sophia, frequently contact me by phone or message, making their family's happiness my happiness too. Yet. What? John and his. As usual, after finishing work, I looked at my personal cell phone to find a ton of missed calls. Calling back that number, I was told of the death of John and his wife. John and his wife were said to have left this world in an accident, just like my parents, but it was hard to believe. No way! My world went dark, and with help from my colleagues, I somehow managed to book a flight to John's town. Arriving, I finished the funeral without being able to believe the reality before me. Sophia's parents, that is, John's in-laws, live a 30-minute drive from where John and his wife lived. Thus, the in-laws actively offered to take care of the young nieces. They want to continue looking after the two. While I felt a bit disappointed, thinking of the young nieces made me accept that it might be for the best. Well, since I have work, I'll be off. Please contact me if you'd be willing to let me look after the nieces. Here's my address and phone number. It's okay. There are cute grandchildren. No need for contact. John's in-laws finished all the procedures and, wanting to see the twin nieces one last time, closed the door in front of me. The nieces must be unstable having lost their parents. Meeting someone and talking might be a burden for them. I tried to forget the cold attitude of the in-laws with those thoughts. However, a month later. Excuse me, Madison, are you there? On my day off, the apartment doorbell suddenly rang fiercely, and upon answering. I found the in-laws furious, each holding a niece's hand. What brings you here all of a sudden? You flew here today? Pushing past me as I asked in surprise, the in-laws with the nieces entered my room. Flew here, yes. Went through a lot of trouble. Father-in-law Thomas seemed quite angry. All that trouble just for what? To hand these two over to you. Mother-in-law Abigail glared at the twins with a stern face. Ignoring my surprise, the in-laws started to surround my room's table. After drinking the coffee I served, they began to speak. We took them in believing they were polite and academically advanced for five-year-olds, but it was entirely different. They break things, throw tantrums quickly. They fight fiercely and don't sleep early. They also don't want to go to preschool. It was so strange we showed them to a doctor friend. Thomas's words surprised me. Although we hadn't met often, the two I knew were well-behaved children. So, what did the doctor say? When I asked, Thomas continued gravely. Both have significant developmental issues. Truly, we were deceived. I was more shocked by Thomas's words of being deceived than the fact that the twin nieces had developmental issues. What do you mean, deceived? We took them in thinking they'd be grandchildren we could be proud of in society. 
Our daughter hardly let us meet them while she was alive. That's right. Because we couldn't meet them, we believed the stories from our daughter about how smart and mature the twins were. The in-laws continued to claim they were victims deceived into taking care of the children. I couldn't believe their words and couldn't help myself but to talk back. Doesn't every child hold an irreplaceable place as your precious daughter? To say such things in front of them. Abigail scoffed at me, trembling with anger. Well, you Madison, who hasn't graduated high school and works in a factory, probably doesn't mind having problematic children, right? That's right. John was excellent, but you're terrible. We thought you would get along with these twins, so we came to hand them over. I remembered John hinting that Sophia wanted to keep her distance from her real parents. And I understood. I, too, wanted to keep my distance from these two, smirking meaninglessly before me. Taking them in would be my wish. I wanted to stay calm for the sake of the twins, who looked anxious. When I told them so with a composed voice, the in-laws burst into loud laughter, perhaps relieved. Ah, good, good. It's best for those who are not excellent to stick together and live together. That's right. I thought it would be hard to live with children in such an old-fashioned apartment, but you seem like the type who wouldn't mind that at all. Good for you. Then they started to boast about how excellent they were. I, too, once aspired to be a doctor and devoted myself to my studies. The bitter memory of not being able to afford medical school and having to become a full-time employee instead. I was so beautiful that I once won a beauty contest. Maybe I could have been the beautiful wife of a doctor. The friend who is a doctor we mentioned earlier was a classmate from when I was aiming to be a doctor. Despite me being better, his family had money. If only your family had money, you could have been a doctor and owned your own hospital, and I could have been the beautiful lady of the house. Their nostalgic remarks with no bragging rights seemed endless. Sorry. I'm not good with what-if discussions. What are you trying to say? Thomas cleared his throat to put an end to it. Well, to summarize, our respectable family lineage does not suit these twins. That's it. The twins with developmental issues are nothing to boast about. Live quietly and lonely with them, since you work in a factory. Maybe we'll visit occasionally, just for the sake of other relatives. Being thought of as a cold grandmother by relatives who know nothing of the situation would be irritating. This cramped house might be destroyed by these twins in no time. Well, it's such an old apartment. If the twins have developmental problems, it won't last even a day. After saying what they wanted, the in-laws stood up, said no farewells to the nieces, and roughly closed the apartment door behind them. Good grief! I sighed and looked at the twin nieces, huddled in the corner of the room. Both of them had tense, stiff faces. It's been a while, hasn't it? It must be surprising to be brought to such a small house all of a sudden. How about we eat some snacks together? The twins trembled and did not move. I placed juice and snacks near them and sat directly on the floor myself. You must be tired, right? Today, you can eat whatever you like and rest as much as you want. At my words, my niece Mia reached for the snacks. Yummy! As Mia began to eat, the other niece, Evelyn, also started. The sight of the small children eagerly eating the snacks was adorable, and I couldn't help but watch. Then, Evelyn, while eating a cookie, accidentally dropped some crumbs. I didn't mind at all, but Mia suddenly got angry when she noticed. You're spilling it! I didn't mean to! Before I could intervene, the nieces started a fierce argument. Let's calm down, both of you. It's okay. I repeatedly spoke to the two, now in a tussle, trying to calm them down. The twins were arguing fiercely. 
imagining how insecure they must have felt since losing their parents, I ended up crying with them. Holding them while we all cried, the nieces stared at me. Madison, do you not want us anymore? Surprised by the question, I quickly stopped crying and shook my head. Of course not. I was looking forward to living happily with everyone starting from today. Why would you ask that? In response to my question, the twin nieces looked sad and glanced at each other. Grandma and Grandpa said noisy kids are sick and not wanted. We thought maybe you didn't want us because we're strange. That's not true at all. Like I said earlier, I was planning to live happily with everyone starting from today. As long as you two don't mind it, we'll live together forever. When I said that with emphasis, the twins looked at each other again and started crying all over. That night, as I watched over the two exhausted and sleeping children, I contacted someone I knew. They needed as much healing as possible for the emotional wounds of losing their parents. And because I couldn't agree with what the in-laws were claiming. From the next day, I poured all the love I could into caring for my two nieces. Of course, it's hard because I'm not their real parent. A five-year-old child can be inconsolable when they cry, and they're at the age where they want to express their willfulness. Still, I faced the two head-on at all times. Perhaps because of that, the two started to look much happier than when they first came to my house. Madison, will you be there even if we fall asleep? Occasionally, they'd ask me this before sleeping, looking a bit insecure. Of course, I'll always be by your side, so don't worry. I always answered gently while watching over the twins. But. But. Living day by day with the sisters in my apartment, I had only one worry. Maybe this place is a bit too small for us all to live together. What are we going to do, Madison? That's right. I guess we'll go ahead with that plan after all. I decided to execute a plan I had been considering for the two of them. When I talked about it, the twins' eyes lit up. But. Their enthusiasm dampened suddenly. What if Grandma and Grandpa come and say mean things to us and you again? Their worry was understandable. Those in-laws had said they would come by sometimes, just to show their face to other relatives. I felt it was my responsibility to erase the traumatic memories they had of them. Both of you, then next time Grandma and Grandpa come. Though there was no need, I whispered to the twins a special plan to repel the in-laws' attack. The chance came during the next long holiday. While Mia, Evelyn, and I were enjoying a leisurely day off, the in-laws suddenly visited. Madison, what are you thinking? Abigail was in lecture mode. What do you mean, what am I thinking? Not what do you mean? Moving into such a fancy high-rise condo. Why would you do something so reckless with two kids? The in-laws were greeted by the beautiful living room of the new high-rise apartment I had moved into. Looking around the spacious and comfortable space, Thomas was also frustrated. How much of a loan did you take out for this, not having gone to high school and working in a factory? I was surprised when I got the notice that you moved. You're not planning to push those uncontrollable grandchildren back onto us, are you? It's impossible. Those twins have developmental issues, they can't live with normal people like us. You're not thinking of asking us for money, are you? As usual, the noisy in-laws prompted me to sigh and start explaining one thing at a time. I purchased this high-rise condo in cash, so don't worry. Cash purchase? How can someone working in a factory do something like that? It's true I work in a factory, but actually. In the middle of my explanation, I heard the sound of small footsteps from the hallway. Grandma, Grandpa, welcome to our house. Hello, please make yourself comfortable. Entering the living room were Mia and Evelyn. Dressed in elegant matching dresses prepared for this day. 
Oh, you look quite cute and intelligent. You wouldn't be embarrassed to show them off anywhere. When the in-laws had them, the two were made to wear the same few clothes over and over, rather than getting any new ones. Knowing this fact, I glared at the in-laws sharply. They've always been very cute and intelligent. Whether they have developmental issues or not, that doesn't change. Why are you making such a scary face all of a sudden? It was the first time the in-laws who had been bad-mouthing me flinched. I was determined to say what I wanted to say on this occasion. I've always wondered, did you really take these two to a doctor and get a diagnosis? Of course. You're saying we're lying? As the in-laws started to panic, I nodded vigorously. Yes. Right after they came here, I had them seen by a specialist I know. And then? And then? They're just unstable because they lost their parents, but there's no problem with their development. You work in a factory and have connections with experts? Is that doctor even reliable? Thomas asked, clearly uneasy, and I responded with anger still in my voice. He's an expert actively researching mental care. I met him through my factory job and have been receiving his kindness. Such a prestigious person through factory work? That's a lie. Even we don't have such distinguished acquaintances. As the in-laws continued with their disrespectful remarks, I pressed on. First of all, the friend Thomas claims to have shown the twins to, isn't he misdiagnosing? Is he even a specialist? What field does he practice in? After shifting his gaze for a while, Thomas answered in a low voice. Orthopedics. That's out of his field! Shocked, I raised my voice, and Abigail raised hers in defiance. A doctor is a doctor, right? He's a renowned doctor who diagnosed this person's slipped disc at a glance. Slipped disc? I was surprised. Abigail's attempt to defend, which didn't really serve as a defense, slightly rejuvenated Thomas, who continued with a smug look. He's out of his field, but there's no mistake he's a renowned doctor. After all, he was a friend from when I aspired to be a doctor. A man as educated and solid as myself. And when exactly did Thomas aspire to be a doctor? What? It must have been an inconvenient question. Thomas, who didn't try to answer with a laugh, received my smirk in return. Hmm? Huh? After an odd exchange of smiles, Thomas looked away and answered again in a low voice. When I was in the first grade of elementary school, all I could do was give a wry smile, but Abigail couldn't let it go. Wait, so all that talk about being praised as a genius when you were younger was actually about when you were in elementary school? It seems Thomas had been boasting quite a bit at home, as Abigail's momentum was fierce. Being called a genius is still amazing, right? And what subject were you called a genius in? Digging further seemed pointless. But I asked anyway. Hmm? Thomas, attempting to feign ignorance again, met my silent gaze. Ah, uh, well, I was good at skipping rope. They would say genius, genius every time I jumped. Thomas confessed in a murmur, sounding utterly pathetic. So, you've been bragging about skipping rope this whole time? What kind of genius is that? And you, boasting non-stop about being first in a beauty contest. Where was that contest held? At a local festival, but? First place in a beauty contest is still first place. Better than skipping rope. A local festival. That's a scam, a scam. Which is better, though? The most trivial marital spat in the world. As the two seemed about to start yelling at each other, I cleared my throat, and the in-laws snapped back to reality. Ah, uh, what were we talking about? Oh yes, our grandchildren having absolutely no developmental issues. That's right, that's right. 
If they're behaving so quietly and cutely, it does make them seem like our grandchildren, doesn't it? The two then united in their approach towards me. Madison, we'll forgive you for recklessly buying a high-rise condo. But living with these children from now on is indeed impossible for you. That's right. What if they say they want to go to medical school? Can you afford their tuition with a factory job? Impossible, right? It's not impossible. The factory I currently manage, all four of them, are running smoothly. I stated the facts calmly, and the in-laws were astonished beyond belief. Factory management? Yes. I started working in a factory after graduating middle school, climbed up the ranks, and took over five years ago. Since then, I've been successfully managing for factories. That would make us not embarrassed to be associated with you in our family. I only knew you worked at a factory. I do work at a factory, that's true. And the connection with the mental care expert was? Yes, since I employ many workers, I wanted to focus on mental care, so I asked him to conduct a seminar, which led to our acquaintance. Buying a high-rise condo in cash too. If you're managing factories, you must have saved a lot, right? So, affording their living expenses and tuition. Well, I lived in an old apartment until now. I can cover my niece's living expenses and tuition with my savings and future income. The in-laws, their eyes shining as they asked about my financial situation, made me sigh, although it was something I had anticipated. Such savings? Give me some. I mean, hey, Madison. Suddenly, Abigail's tone softened as she changed her attitude towards me. It's really too much to leave the grandchildren with you alone. Right, dear? Well, if it's all right with you, we can take the grandchildren off your hands, and Madison, you could support financially. Surrounded by the two inching closer, I could only sigh. I winked at my nieces, sending them a signal. Talking is so boring. We want to play in the park. Let's go to the park. It's okay, right? The twins began begging innocently, as if signaling the start of our plan. Eager to win the twins' favor, the in-laws readily agreed to their proposal. Let's go to the park and play with Grandma and Grandpa. Yes, we need to start getting along better. Even on the way to the park in front of the high-rise condo, the in-laws tried desperately to hold the twins' hands and overacted to get their attention. Yay, park, park! The twins exaggerated their excitement as they entered the park. So, Madison, you're single, and you might find someone nice in the future, right? That's right. If you have these children then, you might find them a nuisance, right? So, let us take the twins, and you just provide financial support. I responded loudly, more than necessary, to the two trying desperately to continue their conversation. No, thank you. On a sunny Saturday afternoon, the park was full of families. Everyone turned to look at us when I raised my voice. Madison, maybe keep your voice down a bit. Worried about public perception, the in-laws panicked at just that. Ignoring their attempts to calm me, I asked the twin nieces loudly. Do you two hate living with grandma and grandpa? The twins responded energetically as if venting their frustration. We absolutely hate living with grandma and grandpa. They're mean. Grandma and grandpa always say horrible things to us. Go away, both of you. Hey, we're offering to take in you orphans, and this is how you repay us? Abigail momentarily showed a demonic expression. But the twins weren't the type to be intimidated. Go away! Go away! The young nieces began loudly chanting for them to leave, and the in-laws were confused. By then, 
The gathered crowd at the park was looking at the in-laws with cold eyes and murmuring among themselves. I seized the perfect moment to raise my voice further. Anyway, you too. Calling them no good, nothing to be proud of. I haven't forgotten the terrible things you said to my precious nieces. Madison, you don't need to bring that up now. You're the ones who forgot what you said and are trying to cozy up now. The idea of taking them in now for show is ridiculous. Abigail turned pale in panic as I pressed on. And to think you're after my money too. If you keep pestering us, I'll call the police. I knew it was a childish threat and that the police wouldn't act on such a matter. But it was highly effective against the two who cared so much about public image. We won't come near again. As they hastily fled the park, the sight of the in-laws' backs was pitiful. Watching them leave, I high-fived my beaming nieces, celebrating our victory. As for the in-laws, their actions regarding the twins eventually became known to other relatives, leading to their social exclusion. Well, I was the one who spread the rumor. This caused their relationship to deteriorate, and they were on the brink of divorce. They were responsible for their own fate. The twin nieces are living happily, receiving proper counseling from my expert acquaintance. We want to live with you forever. They say such moving things. But I aim for them to find their own paths in work and family life, leaving this home healthy and strong. I plan to continue showering them with love, helping them walk their own lives confidently. Ah, uh, Mom. Long time no see. How are you? After a long time, a call from Grace, my daughter living far away. What do you mean, how are you? You hardly ever get in touch. I wish you'd call more often. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's why I'm calling now, right? And, sorry it's so sudden, but can I stay with you for about a week starting tomorrow? Grace got married five years ago and hasn't shown her face even once since the marriage greetings. Sometimes I send a message asking if she won't come home for a visit, but she says she can't find the time or can't get time off work, and she has stopped coming by. Now, my only daughter is coming home for the first time in five years. I was thrilled and immediately reported it to my husband, Joseph, when he came home. Then he said, Grace is? Is something wrong? Something wrong? Do we need a reason for her to come visit after so long? No, we don't but it's just so sudden. He muttered, tilting his head. The next day, Grace returned home, and we had our first family reunion in five years, the three of us. Just when I thought Grace was taking a bath, she seemed to be looking for something. Mom. Can I have a week's worth of old newspapers? They make the closet warm. What? Sure, but... Old newspapers for a closet? I didn't quite understand what she meant but thinking she might have started keeping a pet or something, I handed her the newspapers and gave Grace the closet she would use tonight. Thanks for going out of your way. It's been a while since I've slept in a closet. What? What do you mean? My name is Madison. I live with my husband, Joseph, who just recently turned 60. Joseph is very serious about his work. I take pride in supporting him as a housewife. He's not very talkative but always finishes the meals I cook and always says, thank you for the meal. It might seem ordinary to others, but I find comfort in this daily life. He has said that once he retires, he wants to take me traveling to various places as a thank you for the daily meals. And he wants to take our daughter along too. We have an only daughter, Grace. She got married five years ago and now lives far away, having not shown her face since the marriage greetings. Occasionally, I've sent messages asking if she will come home for a visit, 
but she says she can't find the time or can't get time off work, and she has become distant. Having lived under the same roof for so long, it feels like something is missing without her. I used to think we communicated well enough, and we were a close family, going shopping or watching movies together. Last year, I wanted to celebrate her turning 30, but she was too busy, and schedules didn't align, and another year has passed without doing so. Well, as long as she's doing well, that's what matters most. I didn't think that after living together for so long, we wouldn't end up not seeing each other for such a long time, so I often found myself sighing with loneliness. When will she finally have a break from being busy? But there's no use in just talking about it, so… Maybe I'll wax the floor today? I mutter to myself while dedicating myself to housework. Just a little longer until my husband retires. Once he has more free time, I plan to visit Grace. As I was changing my mood and polishing the floor, a call came in. Perhaps my thoughts reached her, it was a call from Grace. I was very surprised because Grace, who hardly ever shows her face or gets in touch, suddenly called. Ah, mom. Long time no see. How are you? What do you mean, how are you? You hardly ever get in touch. I wish you'd call more often. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's why I'm calling now, right? And, sorry it's so sudden, but can I stay with you for about a week starting tomorrow? I was surprised and, of course, agreed happily. When my husband came home, I immediately told him about today's call. Welcome home. You know, Grace called today and said she's coming here tomorrow. Grace is? Is something wrong? Something wrong? Do we need a reason for her to come visit after so long? No, we don't but it's just so sudden. She said she found some time, so let's ask her about it when she comes. How many years has it been since she came home? Let's put some effort into cooking. I just waxed the floor today. I'll clean the house from top to bottom now. Good to be enthusiastic, but please don't overdo it and collapse. While saying that to me, my husband seemed happy as he watered the plants at the entrance, talking to them. And the next day. It's been a while, both of you. I'll be in your care for a bit. Nice to see you, Grace. Make yourself at home. Grace, whom we hadn't seen in a long time, seemed busy, maybe too busy, as she looked a bit worn out. I was a bit surprised to see Grace, who used to gather various cosmetics and care about her makeup, appear without any, but more than that, her hair seemed much more damaged than it was five years ago. And her simple attire, unlike her usual interest in fashion and various clothes, made me wonder if this was her way of becoming an adult. But I had to force myself to find words of acceptance. It seemed a bit too forced. Anyway, she made the effort to visit her parents' home despite being busy, so I wanted to let her relax as much as possible. For dinner, I prepared Grace's favorite dishes. Mom, you never fail. Everything's delicious. Grace said it was delicious as she ate, but she left almost everything after just a bite or two. I went to prepare a bed for Grace while she was taking a bath, grabbing the freshly laundered bedding I had taken in the day before. Then, Grace, who had finished her bath without me noticing, Mom, called out. Grace used to take long baths for beauty reasons, so I was preparing leisurely, which made me a bit puzzled. When I went towards where I heard her voice, Grace was in front of the closet. Wondering what she needed from the closet, it seemed like she was looking for something. Ah, uh, Mom. Can I have a week's worth of old newspapers? They make the closet warm. Uh, sure. Old newspapers for a closet? I didn't quite understand what she meant, thinking maybe she had started keeping a pet or something, but I gave them to her since she asked. Regaining my composure, I carried the bedding to Grace's room. 
Thanks for going out of your way. It's been a while since I've slept in a closet, she said as she received them. I was surprised, but felt it was somehow inappropriate to ask if she had started keeping a pet. So, I just stood there, mouth shut. Grace seemed puzzled by my silence and tilted her head. Mom, what's wrong? Uh, nothing. I could only reply before leaving the room. My husband, who had been watching the exchange from the shadows, said, Hey, Madison. Don't you think there's something odd about Grace's behavior? Yes. I shared my concerns about Grace's bare face, her overly simple attire, and how she barely ate, or rather, seemed unable to eat much at dinner. It turned out my husband had the same worries, and he sat down, covering his face with both hands. After a while, he looked at me with determination, nodded firmly and said, Let's gently ask Grace about it tomorrow. For now, let's just go to sleep. A bad feeling stirred in my chest, but I decided to trust my husband's words and went back to my room, trying not to think about anything and just sleep. When you want to clear your mind, take a deep breath. Before I knew it, I had fallen into a deep sleep. In the morning, Grace helped me prepare breakfast. This really feels like our family's breakfast. Brings back memories. Grace, you can sit down and wait for it to be ready too. Our trivial conversation brought a smile to my husband's face. The discomfort from the day before seemed like an unfounded worry, and I was tempted to believe everything was fine, reminded of our life before in this peaceful atmosphere. Comforted by the familiar scene, my husband went on to water the houseplants and do his morning exercises as part of his routine. Then, Grace suddenly shouted loud enough to drown out the music from my husband's radio exercises. I'm sorry. Startled by the sudden outburst, my husband rushed to the kitchen. I stopped making soup and turned around to see Grace apologizing over and over, dousing her fried eggs in sauce and shaking slightly. Confused by the situation and seeing Grace trembling, I froze. But my husband approached her slowly and patted her gently. It's okay. Then, taking the sauce from Grace's hand and applying it to the rest of the fried eggs, he said in a calm tone. Then, in a gentle tone, Our family prefers sauce on our fried eggs, don't we? Is it different for Robert? Grace seemed to remember something. Robert gets really mad if there's no soy sauce and said in a low voice. At that moment, I finally understood the unease I felt yesterday and why Grace had come home. I was ashamed of how happy I was about my daughter's return, as I could imagine her position in her household. It's likely that Grace's husband, Robert, does not treat her as an equal. Grace's attire was not simple but could be considered plain. She might not wear makeup because she's not allowed to buy cosmetics. Her damaged hair and worn-out appearance could be due to stress. I had thought Robert, Grace's husband and a colleague who is four years her senior, was a sociable young man with a refreshing smile when I met him, but I found myself clenching my fists in anger that I could not suppress. Then, my husband, Madison, gave me a look and said, Let's have breakfast. He must have realized I was trembling with anger. He implied that making a scene now would only hurt Grace. My husband is truly wise. I quietly began setting the table with enough forks and glasses of water so we could start eating. Grace seemed a bit calmer, silently took her seat, and drank a little water. Deciding not to bring up the conversation for now, we finished breakfast as if nothing had happened and then sat back at the table to relax, at which point I tried to broach the subject with Grace without being too direct. Grace, don't worry about staying just a week. Feel free to stay here without any reservations. Grace glanced at her dad for a moment, then averted her gaze and whispered. But Robert won't allow it. When I asked if she was worried about Robert, she hesitated before saying, 
Not exactly, but... And looked down. Realizing that pursuing this topic might corner Grace made me feel uneasy. Yet, to protect her, it was clear we needed to hear her story to separate her from Robert. My husband, with a determined look, told Grace. I'll do anything for your happiness, so lean on us without worry. Grace remained downcast for a while, but then lifted her head and began. Actually. She prefaced before slowly starting to share the details of her married life. The conditions she described lightly surpassed our imagination in their deplorability, hard to believe they could be inflicted by someone she had vowed to spend her life with. For starters, even before their marriage, unreasonable demands and verbal abuse were often hurled at her in the workplace, and once home, she was subjected to cruel words that denied her very personhood and simple verbal abuse. Furthermore, she was deprived of her closet and all means of communication with the outside world, including her mobile phone, were controlled by Robert, making it impossible for her to seek help. Despite both working, she was forcibly burdened with all the household chores. Robert next allowed her not to work so she was forced to quit her job, and if she did something displeasing, he would immediately find fault and berate her. If Grace fell ill, she would be scolded instead for not being able to manage her health. Even her beloved fashion, makeup, and cosmetics were deemed a waste of money and she was not allowed to purchase them satisfactorily. When I was shaking with anger to the point that veins were bulging on my forehead, Grace said. But Robert is also struggling because he has no outlet for his stress. In a way that seemed to defend him. That's irrelevant. My husband raised his voice in anger. Let's take it easy. I responded by grabbing his arm in an attempt to calm him. My hand was trembling slightly. Seeing my husband shake with anger, just like me, at the attention focused on our daughter, helped me regain some calm. I couldn't understand why Grace would make such a statement in defense of him, despite being subjected to such unreasonable treatment, and I looked at my husband's expression. Perhaps sensing my intent or able to imagine Grace's feelings, my husband showed a sad expression and said, Grace has always been a kind child, but... He paused before adding, I, as your parent, cannot forgive Robert, and I think you should leave him. It was rare for my usually reticent husband to make such a definitive statement, so his feelings were painfully clear to me. At the same time, I somewhat understood the reason for Grace's defense of Robert from my husband's pained expression. It must have been a form of self-defense, a way to protect herself. Believing that he was not at fault was the only way she could protect herself, perhaps because she was too traumatized to make a sound judgment. The reality that our daughter had been so badly hurt was thrust upon us, leaving us overwhelmed with frustration and helplessness, tears unstoppable. And the anger towards Robert, who could hurt his wife so much and carry on as if nothing happened, made us tense with rage. We are not heartless parents who could stay silent after seeing our daughter hurt like this. She is our daughter, whom we have cherished and loved dearly. A serious, personable, and kind daughter, liked by everyone. We all believe such a person should never have to suffer harm from anyone. We will protect Grace and ensure she divorces Robert to reclaim the life she deserves. Because there are limits to what a layman can do, we need to find a trustworthy lawyer. Even after a week had passed, we kept Grace at our home. Abusive messages asking why she was not at home were sent to her multiple times by Robert, so we had Grace turn off her mobile phone. Likely, he was managing the GPS too. His messages made it seem like he knew she was at our house, her family home, but thankfully, there was no sign of him showing up in person. Then, we hired a wise lawyer with good online reviews to ensure Grace's divorce proceedings went smoothly and started gathering evidence. At first, Robert flatly refused to divorce, 
but he quieted down after testimonies were obtained from co-workers about the verbal abuse and unreasonable demands Grace faced while still employed. Moreover, testimonies from neighbors about hearing Robert shouting at Grace and finding recorded calls between Grace and him forced him to consent to the divorce. It seems he was the type to make enemies even among those around him. It's clear that no matter how much one tries to improve their outward behavior, it cannot fully cover their actions. But even with the divorce confirmed, we cannot be at ease. Considering Robert's nature, it's unlikely he will remain quiet. Taking the lawyer's advice to use the law's full force, we decided to ask Grace if she would be willing to file a lawsuit. My true desire is to use the full force of the law to ensure that our daughter never has to face him again, but I wonder what Grace's feelings on the matter were. We must not forget that our actions were taken not for revenge against Robert but solely to protect Grace. Overstepping what she desires would be wrong and not what we want. After some thought, Grace shared, I don't want to go back to that life, and I never want to see Robert again. Therefore, we decided to do everything we could, which included seeking a restraining order through the courts. Surprisingly, the restraining order was easily granted, and Robert was ordered to pay a significant amount of compensation. The crime of trampling on human dignity was recognized as grave, and it felt like a slight weight was lifted from our hearts. Grace, a bit more spirited now, understood how far from normal her situation had been and had secretly confided the real circumstances, which she couldn't share with her parents, to the lawyer who had been helping her. Though usually bound by confidentiality, this time the lawyer informed us, suggesting we take care of it as a family or, if necessary, introduce her to a specialist that before marrying, Grace had a good relationship with Robert as colleagues. They were seen as a perfect couple by those around them, carrying a good image. However, as time passed, only Grace's honesty, work ethic, and achievements were recognized. And she began to outpace Robert in the company. Robert, though sociable, had a high pride and often blamed others when things didn't go well, which meant he didn't receive favorable evaluations. The gap between Grace and him gradually widened, and it was accepted with a sense of inevitability by those around them. There was talk among peers about whether Grace would leave Robert or if Robert should be supported by Grace, which eventually reached Robert's ears. From that point, Robert began to take out his jealousy and irritation on Grace, effectively controlling her social interactions and making it impossible for her to leave. After she tried to break it off once, his escalation prevented any separation, leading Grace to think she might just have to endure it. Robert's jealousy of Grace, who was well regarded by her peers, did not cease, and he began to verbally abuse her within the company, often witnessed by colleagues. However, this was never brought to light, and Grace, under Robert's control, had no one she could turn to for advice. Upon marrying, she was forced to quit her job. Grace intended to support the household finances through dual incomes, and initially, Robert agreed. However, once married, he changed his attitude. As a housewife, Grace found herself restricted in every aspect. Firstly, financially. Due to unreasonable demands to reduce spending, she was deprived of her closet and all communication devices including her mobile phone, were controlled by Robert to cut costs. There were also restrictions on going out, and she could no longer take care of her appearance, resulting in damaged hair and skin. Women tend to improve their mood by doing their hair, dressing fashionably, applying makeup, and engaging in such recreational activities, but it seems all of these were taken away by Robert. Seeing Grace living a restricted life made Robert mistakenly believe he had the upper hand, leading to an escalation in his unreasonable verbal abuse and demands. It's a disturbing story. Hearing this from the lawyer, I've often wanted to scold my past self for not seeing through such a cowardly man. It became clear that Grace, having had her means of communication, 
including her mobile phone, taken away and her outings restricted, struggled to contact us. Certainly, if she couldn't use her mobile phone except in front of Robert, she couldn't ask for help. We regret not actively reaching out to Grace instead of waiting for her to contact us, such as visiting her or stopping by when we were out and about. To avoid Robert's verbal abuse and unreasonable demands, Grace was forced to appease him, likely leading her to suppress her own feelings and act against her will. The only silver lining was when Robert left Grace's mobile phone at home during a long business trip, allowing Grace a chance to contact us. Whether it was accidental or intentional, without it, Grace might not have reached out to us. We're grateful Grace found the courage to ask for our help. And that we noticed the changes in our daughter. I was glad we could be of assistance. Initially, when we heard everything from Grace, we were filled with regret for not noticing her situation sooner, but now, we're genuinely relieved to see Grace smiling and living with us. We didn't lose our daughter, after all. Currently, Grace spends her days with us. She occasionally helps my husband with his gardening hobby, sweating together. Though my husband planned to get into it more seriously after retirement, with Grace's help, we might consider expanding it sooner. I've been entertaining the idea of eventually selling our produce at markets or supermarkets, though it's just my wishful thinking, but it would be a joy if that day comes. In any case, I'm glad we could bring back Grace's smile. We haven't returned to joking around or nagging each other like before, but I'm looking forward to gradually seeing the old Grace return.